Sam watched the other children meeting their parents at the school gate, moms and dads kneeling to greet their sons and daughters. Some parents held their kids' hands as they walked. Others tried, but were met with the mortified expressions of their two cool preteens. Sam slunk past them and made his way home alone. When he arrived, his mother was in the front garden, tending to her rose bush. Sam knew precious little about his mother, but he knew not to bother her when she was gardening. The only time he had ever seen his mother smile with any sincerity was while she was holding a pair of secateurs. And during those brief moments, she could almost pass as a normal human being. Sam took a deep breath, then opened the front gate and scurried past. He almost made it to the door when his mother spun around and caught him by the arm. Blossom wasn't a large or imposing woman, but her sinewy arms were toughened by age and graft, giving her a strong grip that was not easily slipped. Sam lowered his head as she studied him curiously, a bird of prey eyeing its next meal. There's a corned beef sandwich on the side she said, letting him go. Eat it, and then go to your room. I'm busy and I don't want to see you until supper. Yes, mother. She released his arm, and he could feel her watching as he rushed into the house. A wave of relief washed over him, not because he was back home, but because there was a wall separating them, at least for the time being. The sandwich was a bland affair, amounting to little more than one thick slice of corned beef slapped between two thin pieces of white bread. No butter, no dressing, no salad. He spiced it up by squirting a small amount of ketchup on it, spreading it over the beef with one finger. He had to be careful when he took something without permission. Sam ate the sandwich, washed up his plate, and retired to his room. Although denied a television, he could keep books, and he found enough life amongst the pages to make his own bearable. He ran a finger across the spines on his bookshelf. Many of them were tattered and misshapen, read and reread not only by him, but by countless others before him. In a funny way, Sam supposed they were sort of kindred spirits, sharing the same journey reading the same pages they had once read in their own houses, in their own times. His finger stopped on The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. He plucked it from the shelf, flopped onto his bed, and began reading. The soft clicking of his mother's secateurs as they snipped branches and dead flower heads floated in the open window, providing a monotonous soundtrack. Before long, he was in Middle Earth with Bilbo and the dwarves, and much to the hobbit's dismay, they were off to kill a dragon. The vague hum of voices outside pulled him from the book around an hour later, and he set it aside to see what was happening. His window was small, but it overlooked the street. His mother stood at the garden gate, speaking with another woman of a similar age. She took off her gardening gloves and shook the woman's hand. A wide, insincere smile occupying her face like graffiti on the side of a condemned building. Sam didn't know who the other woman was, but he recognized the girl holding her hand. It was Sandy from maths class. Sandy had changed out of her uniform and was now wearing a pretty floral summer dress. She had also discarded the ponytail, opting for a pair of pigtails that hung over each shoulder like foxtails. He liked Sandy. She was the only person that ever really made an effort to talk to him. And when she did, she actually listened to what he had to say. Sandy looked nervous and Sam saw she was holding a small, colorful box wrapped up with ribbons. 
The other woman, presumably Sandy's mother, spoke for a few moments. Then Blossom shook her head gravely and gestured toward Sam's bedroom window. All three looked up at the same time, and Sam panicked, backing out of sight. After a few more minutes talking, Sandy reluctantly handed the box to Blossom, and the two visitors left. Sandy looked up at his window one last time as they walked away. Disappointment etched on her face. Sam sighed. He fished a pin from his school bag and walked over to the Marvel Comics calendar on his wall. There was only a single significant date on it. He drew a diagonal line through today's box in which he had drawn the number 12 in felt tip pen. Happy birthday, said to himself and went back to reading. When 7 p.m. came, Sam made his way downstairs for supper. In the kitchen, there was another sandwich, this time containing two sad-looking pieces of cheap cheese and nothing else. He sat at the kitchen table alone and ate it, listening to the muffled sound of voices and telltale lights flickering in the living room. His mother sat in front of the television for hours every night, but it was difficult to tell whether she enjoyed it. Blossom would stare at the screen, watching the programs from beginning to end, without ever changing the severe expression on her face. Sam had recently settled on the notion that she wasn't just watching the people on the screen, she was studying them, and that frightened him. Blossom was different outside the house. Whenever someone visited, she would slip into a pre-prepared <laughs> character onto a stage no one else could see. As soon as they were alone again, the facade would slip away like rotten meat off the bone. Something was wrong with his mother, and Sam didn't understand it. He was washing the crumbs off his plate when the muffled sounds of the television abruptly quieted. Sam? Sam hesitated, wondering if he could successfully sneak away, but ultimately decided against it. It's me, mother, he said. Good. Come here, will you? Her voice was soft, which was unusual. When he walked into the living room, he saw his mother sat in her usual reclining armchair, lit dimly by the artificial glow of the television. A thin nightgown covered her bony frame, and she held a glass of wine in one hand. A slim trail of smoke rose to the ceiling, coming from the cigarette, resting between her lips. Sam stopped in the doorway. Come closer. He stepped forward. She set down the wine glass and picked up a piece of paper from her lap. He took it and saw that it was a crumpled 10 pound note. Happy birthday, she said. Thank you, he smiled knowing full well that she had forgotten all about it. Sandy's visit had reminded her. He waited for her to mention Sandy, but she just clicked the remote and unmuted the TV, watching the actors in some brightly lit soap opera engaging in their own personal dramas. Has anyone else called to see me? He blurted out in a tone that clearly tipped his hand. His mother turned to him. Her face crumpled in a frown. She plucked the cigarette from her lips and smirked. Just some whore. Wanted to know if you were having a party. She took a long drag on the cigarette and exhaled. I told her you weren't well. Sandy isn't a whore, he said, outrage welling in the pit of his stomach. She's nice. Why did you tell her that? Because girls like that will tempt you. They'll play with your mind and turn it to mush. I won't allow it. But... But nothing. She pointed her crabby hand at him, the end of the cigarette between her fingers glowing softly. A whore like that tempted your father too. And now he's dead because of it. Blossom sounded calm, but her upper lip flicked up into a momentary snarl as she spoke 
It was a very small tell, but Sam was familiar with it. Okay, Mom, I'm sorry, he said, yielding to the battle before it became a war. She gestured at the note in his hand. Put that money somewhere safe. I will. As Sam walked back to his room, he wondered where his mother might have hidden Sandy's gift. He decided he would wait for his mother to go to bed and look for it then. It was nearly midnight when he heard the unmistakable shuffling of slippers past his bedroom, and he gave it another half an hour beyond that before getting out of bed. He had been through this mission several times before, often to steal a slice of bread or a glass of milk while the coast was clear, but he had never been out more than a few minutes. If he was ever caught, he just wouldn't get caught, he decided. The door to his room creaked when it opened too far, so he cracked it only wide enough for him to squeeze through into the hall. He tiptoed along the edge of the wall and counted the steps as he descended the staircase. One, two, three, four. On step five, there would be a very loud creak. So he braced his hand on the wall and leapt from one side of the hall to the other, landing as softly as possible. When his feet touched the cold tiles of the kitchen floor, he was safe. He yawned hard and began searching for the gift box. He started by looking under Blossom's chair but found nothing except an empty cigarette packet and a warren of wooly dust bunnies. The cupboards in the living room were equally barren aside from the locked drinks cabinet, which you could see through the glass was fully stocked. Fitting an average-sized gift in there alongside the alcohol would have been an impressive feat in itself. Sam went back into the kitchen to comb through the cupboards. He spotted his mother's sacred tours resting near the sink, and on the work stop around them was a litter of small white shapes, little triangles and squares of paper all with words printed on them, some of them still clinging to the curved blades of the secateurs. The trial of shapes led to the bin beneath the counter. He pressed his foot gently on the pedal. The lid rose and showed a pile of shredded paper, a mountain of hacked words resting on top of old food and empty wine bottles. Sam took a handful out and laid them on the table, trying to figure out what it was. Finally, he found a large piece with words he recognized, Treasure Island. Sam thought of Sandy, handing over a small package with the dimensions of a book to his mother, and grit his teeth so hard that they squeaked against each other in the back of his mouth. Pure rage welled up inside him, like the foam in a shaken soda bottle. How could she do this? She hadn't just thrown it away or hidden it. She'd hacked it to pieces, destroyed something meant for him, something he would have cherished, something given to him by the only person he could ever even describe as friendly. He pulled as much as he could from the bin and placed it inside a plastic bag. She might have stopped him from reading it, but she wouldn't stop him from owning it. He would put it someplace she would never find. That way, he would know he had beaten her. But that wasn't enough. He was still angry. He wanted to take something from her. Sam was woken up the next morning by a scream. He sat, bolt upright in bed, his brain still groggy and his eyes stinging. There was banging, crashing, and shouting coming from downstairs. And what he had done the night before came flooding back. Now he was afraid. A door slammed and feet thudded on the staircase. They made the landing and a few stomps later stopped at his door. It swung open and his mother stood there, her face twisted in fury. Blood ran down her arms, and it took him a while to understand what she was holding. 
It was the branches of the rosebush he had sliced away in the night, each one with a withering flower at the tip. The thorns pierced her hands and she held them tight, regardless. You fucking little devil, she snarled, her voice a stinger injecting venom into the air. You cut up my bu- he began to say in defense, but before he could finish, she was on him. She hauled the covers off and swung the clippings like a whip. The barbed thorns bit into his exposed flesh like tiny knives as she struck again and again, making his skin leak in thin red rivers onto the bedsheets. Devil, she chanted, repeating the word with each strike, Devil. her eyes wild and bloodshot. Devil. Devil, Sam squirmed and scooped himself into a tight ball, an armadillo without the armor. She only stopped whipping when the clippings lay snapped and broken in her hand, Sam's body a twisted canvas of blood and rose petals. She dropped the bloody clippings to the floor and left, returning a moment later with a box of plasters. Sam tried to weep, but his breath wouldn't catch in his lungs. You'll live, she said, throwing the box into the bed. Wash it off in the shower. If anyone asked what happened, you fell into the bush. She left him there, beaten and bleeding. After several minutes, his breath returned. He wept. After he had cleaned the blood away, he applied plasters to the worst of the wounds. His chest and stomach sported hundreds of superficial nicks and scratches, but his arms and shoulders had taken the brunt of the attack. There were shallow gashes and rips all over them, and a few places where the thorns were still embedded in his skin. He listened between sobs as his mother grabbed the phone at the bottom of the stairs and called his school, informing them that Sam would be off due to a terrible sickness. She didn't mention that it was hers. Blossom had beaten him before, but he had never seen the kind of fury she unleashed that morning. He had glimpsed murder in her eyes. If she had been holding something more solid in her hands, he was sure he would be dead. His father, Griffin, had died many years ago when Sam didn't know what dying really meant. When he was old enough to wonder where his daddy was, Blossom told him his father had died in his car, along with a woman she would only ever refer to as the whore. He had assumed it was a crash, but later found out through town gossip that the car hadn't been moving at all. Someone had stabbed them both multiple times in a car park on the outskirts of town. Police never found the killer. Although they didn't have to search very hard to find motives, it turned out that Griffin was a reckless gambler, spending most evenings dining at the poker table instead of the dinner table. Police assumed he owed some impatient people who had gotten tired of waiting. Sam suspected another culprit. He always found it odd that his mother refused to acknowledge Griffin despite the tragic circumstances of his death and when she did mention him, she was more likely to spit his name than speak it. Had she killed his father for his sins? Did she want to kill Sam too? Why? Was it because he was his father's son? Because he reminded her of his betrayal? The real reason, he suspected, was far scarier. Maybe his mother was just evil. The next few days, which Sam spent lying in bed covered in plasters, gave him a lot of time to think. Every shift of his muscles, every movement of his body, drew a constellation of pain across his skin. Sam wanted to show his mother how it felt to be in so much pain, but he had never been a brave boy, and he was certainly not capable of violence. Sam was kind and thoughtful and mild-mannered, virtues shared by many of the heroes in the books he read. He could try a prayer then. God hadn't listened to Sam before, but maybe he would this time. Sam knelt 
at the side of his bed as gingerly as he could, resting his elbows on the mattress. It had been a while since he had done this. He thought for a moment about what to say. He wanted to ask for an abandoned satellite to fall out of the sky onto his mother's head, or for a previously undiscovered volcano to erupt directly underneath her as she pruned her garden. But these were silly requests. Besides, he wasn't even sure he wanted to hurt her. Anger was a passing emotion, after all. As far as Sam knew, nobody existed in a perpetual state of anger, not even the very worst of people. After he had cut her rosebush, he felt regret, but it was too late by then. His mother would surely forgive him one day for the desecration of her beloved rose bush. And one day in the far flung future, Sam would forgive her for beating him bloody with the remnants of said bush. His religious studies teacher, a dour man with a sad smile and a handlebar mustache told him that good men are forgiving. In this case, Sam thought that forgiveness was still a ways off but not entirely impossible. Besides, revenge was not a wish New Testament God was known for granting. Instead, he put his palms together, closed his eyes, and simply asked that Blossom get her roses back and then left him alone, which seemed like a perfectly reasonable request considering the circumstances. That night, every time Sam was jolted by pain, or woke up sweating after a vivid nightmare, he said a few more prayers. To God, Allah, Zeus, and any other fucking God that would listen. Just to be sure. The next morning, Sam removed his old plasters, which were caked in sweat and blood, and replaced them with fresh ones. Then he carefully made his way downstairs for breakfast. When he got there, he found he was alone. He listened carefully. There was nothing. Even the television was off. Was she gone? Was he on his own? Sam thought of the scene in Home Alone when Kevin McAllister wished his family away and woke up the next morning to an empty house. He stepped towards the front door and as he did, it swung open so hard that it struck one of the walls with a loud bang. Shit. Blossom cursed, barging past him over to the sink. What's wrong? He said, startled. Get me a towel, quickly. Sam went to the drawer under the kitchen window and pulled out a tea towel. He glanced out the front door and saw something that wasn't possible. This can't have happened, he thought. He briefly wondered how long he had been sleeping, but unless he'd been out for months, there's no way they could grow so fast. He had cut the heads off with a clear foot of stem below each of them, which should have put any notion of flowers to rest for at least another year, probably even two. But there they were, standing proudly atop the bush like trophies. Give me the towel, his mother shouted, snapping him out of it. Damn thing nicked me. She cradled her forearm under the sink. Sam saw that she was bleeding and wanted to say something sarcastic, like, join the club. But he really didn't want a confrontation right now. How are they back? Sam said. Go upstairs, she said through gritted teeth. I haven't eaten yet, he pleaded. His stomach let out a tiny grumble of agreement. Can I have some cereal? She waved him off dismissively. Just take the box upstairs. Sam took one more glance at the rose bush and went to his room. He climbed into his bed and lay down, plucking handfuls of cornflakes from the box and shoveling them into his mouth. Had she gotten a new bush? No, she wouldn't do that. His granddad planted it for Blossom a few weeks before his sudden death, so she would never replace it. Sam felt an overwhelming sense of unease deep in his stomach. Not because the flowers had somehow grown back, but because the ones that did weren't the same color as before. They were pitch black. 
The doctor arrived the next day. He was in his late fifties, mostly bald with a salt and pepper goatee. He shook Sam's hand firmly, introducing himself as Dr. Reese. The old man glanced at the plasters on Sam's arms and elected to ask no questions about them, which Sam was eternally grateful for. Dr. Reese carried a small brown bag, which Sam imagined was filled with a variety of medical paraphernalia. Several bottles of pills were in there too, based on the rattling sound it made when the doctor walked. When Sam opened the door to his mother's room, he stepped back from the entrance and allowed the doctor to go in alone. Miss Hargreaves, Dr. Reese asked softly. Blossom was on the side and she turned to look at him. She had large, dark bags under her eyes, and she was covered in sweat. It itches, she whispered, running one hand up and down her arm, fingers bent like a leaf rake. There were raised bumps all over her skin, almost like goose pimples, except these were the size of marbles. Okay, let's take a look, the dog said, sitting sideways on the edge of the bed. He unclipped his bag and took out a small notebook and pen. Describe the feeling for me if you can. It burns like a rash, except it's underneath my skin, she said, her voice begging. I feel like there's an army of ants marching through my veins. I can't reach them. Please, you need to give me something to get rid of it. Sam saw Dr. Reese scribble in the notepad. He saw the words subdermal and persistent. I'll see what I can do, he said, his voice a tenor of practiced sympathy. What about the bumps on your skin? Are they new? They've been getting bigger, Blossom said, focusing on one and scratching it hard. It bobbed around like a tiny balloon filled with something thick and glutinous. Bigger? Bigger and itchier. May I see? He leaned over and pushed his glasses further up his nose. Blossom held her arm out for him. He poked, prodded, and probed with the biggest bump with his pen. He made no observations out loud, aside from a few soft hums under his breath. Mm, looks like a bug bite or a sting of some kind. I'll give you some ointment for the itching, should keep it under control. I'd suggest washing your sheets in case it's bed bugs. Let me know if it persists or gets worse. But honestly, it doesn't look like anything life-threatening. Dr. Reese said his goodbyes and left. And as he closed the door behind him, Sam hoped the good doctor was correct in his diagnosis. The ointment lasted about eight hours before it was gone. It had only stemmed the itching for a little while, but then it returned twice as bad. No matter how much Sam's mother applied, the bumps continued to grow and dry out and now some of them were enormous. They sat proud on her arm, a mountainous diorama with the skin pulled tight and sore, like bunches of bright red grapes. Some of them stood absurdly tall, and they reminded Sam of the old Looney Tunes cartoons, where Wiley E. Coyote would be hit in the head with an anvil, and a big lump would sprout out with birds and stars flying around it. Something deep inside him wanted to push it in with one finger, if only to see if it popped out again on the other side. Dr. Reese arrived for a second visit later that day, after Sam had called on his mother's behest, and this time his curiosity was piqued. Reese finished pulling on his thin blue latex gloves. Tell me if this hurts, he said, and he squeezed one of the largest bumps on Blossom's arm. It reacted in a way none of them expected. There was a small puff of powder that flew out into the doctor's face, who coughed and waved his hand at it. Then a viscous yellow-green liquid spilled from the tip, dripping down her arm. It hurts, it hurts, his mother shouted, her other hand grasping at the bedsheets. Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Reese said sympathetically. I'll be quick if you can tough it out for me. He squinted through his glasses, watching as several cracks appeared near the tip, running down to the base of the growth like the skin of a red banana. 
then it split open with a wet pop, and the flaps of broken skin fell against his mother's arms like slices of bloody gammon. She screamed as if she was on fire, and the rest of the lumps followed the first, popping and splitting like tomatoes in a hot frying pan. Each one let out a puff of particles, filling the air. Sam slapped his hand over his mouth to stifle a scream of his own, and the doctor leapt backwards so fast that he lost his balance and tumbled to the floor. Oh my God, he said, his voice shaking. I've never seen anything like this. He stood, hurried out of the room, seized Sam by the arm and dragging him out too. Dr. Reese shut the door behind him, stifling the ongoing screams of Blossom. What's going on? Sam asked. Has your mother traveled out of the country in the past two months? Dr. Reese gasped. He wiped a handkerchief across his face, cleaning off a concoction of sweat and powder. No, we've never left this town. Has she been behaving differently or changing her routines at all? No, always the same. What about these? The doctor said, pulling up one of Sam's sleeves to reveal the plasters. I was messing around and I fell into mother's rose bush out front. The thorns scratched me up pretty good. The doctor looked at him skeptically, but after a few moments he dropped his gaze and began gathering his thoughts. He paced back and forth, the only noises coming from his shoes scuffling on the carpet and the muffled screams of his mother behind the bedroom door. Son, I need you to keep that room shut and stay out of there until I come back. I don't know what this is, certainly nothing I've ever seen or read about in my 40 years, and I must find out before anyone else comes into contact. It might be something exotic, or it could be a hybrid disease. Hell, it could even be a completely new phenomenon altogether. He chuckled a little as he thought of something. Probably wondering if the new discovery would be named after him, Sam thought. Dr. Reese continued. Either way, it could be contagious, so we can't risk spreading it. Sam nodded. The wide-eyed panic, or was it excitement, on Dr. Reese's face scared him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't go in there. Don't touch her. I'm going to my office to call some people who can help. Do nothing until I come back. What if you don't come back? What do I do? Dr. Reese placed a hand on Sam's shoulder and looked him in the eye. I'll come back, he said. I promise. The next few hours of waiting were the easiest, but after hour six, Sam began to worry. The constant whimpering and occasional wailings of his mother were maddening, and he wished he could help, but he had not yet broken his promise to the doctor. After the noises from inside the forbidden room ceased at around the 10th hour of waiting, Sam began to wonder if the doctor had forgotten about him. Maybe he was still trying to find out what disease Blossom had caught. Or maybe he had found out and now he was staying away. Would that be worse? Either way, Sam had to make up his mind. Should he look inside just in case she was better? Or should he listen to the doctor's advice and stay clear? It was the not knowing that was driving him crazy. He supposed he had to check on her, if only to make sure she wasn't limbering up on the other side of the door, getting ready to shoulder barge it down and beat him to death. After all, he wished this mysterious disease on her, hadn't he? He sent an angry wish out into the void, and someone, or something, had granted it. He told himself it would only take a second, a simple casual glance into the maw of hell, and then he would know for sure. The short walk to the master bedroom felt like a long and arduous trek, and Sam made it like a death row inmate, making his way to the execution chamber. He paused at the bedroom door, taking a moment to gather himself. Then he grasped the handle. He turned it slightly and winced when there was a stark metallic squeaking coming from the mechanism. A sound sang like an industrial choir in the still air of the house. 
Finally, when the handle was all the way down, he pushed the door ajar. The stench was immediate and staggering. He gagged and covered his face with his forearm to keep it out. But as soon as his mother came into view around the door, his arm fell back down. His jaw followed it. She was laying still on the bed. The covers pulled up over her stomach. The street light just outside the bedroom window leaked in through the drawn curtains, casting shards of warm orange light over the room. Blossom's arms were completely covered in growths now. Some of them had opened up like the first, while the others were bulging great bulbs, waiting for their turn to bloom. There were other wounds too, where sharp protrusions had ripped through the skin of her arm like shark teeth. Her upper torso was horribly thin, with the growths and thorns spread across her collar and chest, hanging limply against her skin, some as big as golf balls. Sitting atop the form of his mother wasn't her usual skeletal face, however. Her head was an enormous rugby ball sat atop the hilariously insufficient structure of her neck as if someone had grabbed her around the midsection and squeezed like you would a toothpaste tube, sending all her contents to the top. The wrinkles she had once sported around her brow and in the corners of her eyes were now gone, pulled taut by the extra surface area. Her gray hair lay in discarded strands on the pillow around her grossly inflated head. Her bald crown was so tightly stretched that he could see the intricate maps of thin blue veins just beneath the surface. Sam's lungs tightened suddenly, and he realized that he hadn't breathed since he entered. When he did, he immediately regretted it. The aroma was a smorgasbord of different things that should not be combined. Strong, fruity smells were followed by the faint notes of decay, and the warm smell of off meat was quelled by a sudden wave of rotting popcorn. It was a hell all its own, and one meant for the nose. Mother, Sam said, creeping closer to the bed. There was no response. He studied her chest, searching for signs of life. It didn't rise or fall enough for him to see in the twilight of the bedroom, so he leaned in close to listen. As he turned his cheek to her face, his mother blinked her eyes open. They were bloodshot and lit with madness. And they pierced his own eyes like hot needles. Sam staggered backwards and caught his back hard on the bedside table, knocking the wind from his lungs. Blossom shrieked and sat bolt upright, her face twisted and agonized, then lurched over the side of the bed towards him. When she emerged from the covers, he saw that the rest of her body hadn't escaped the attention of the disease. There were growths protruding from everywhere. Her back and her collarbones were sprouting spikes and bulbs every couple of inches, and he could see bumps in her nightgown where the rest of them hid mercifully from sight. She dropped to the floor with a soft thud. Crawling after Sam, the bony spikes along her forearms scraped the floorboards as she moved, leaving thin scratches along the wood. Sam saw one of the bulbs on her shoulder burst open, spilling a mixture of pus and blood onto the floor. Sam tried to scramble backwards, but it was too late. She caught hold of his foot. Her grip was vice-like and he felt a surge of pain as a thorn growing from her palm impaled the flesh above his ankle. Sam tried to catch his breath, but he was panicking now. He needed to break free and get out of the room. Sam threw his arm frantically under the bed, grasping for anything hard and heavy. His fingers brushed against something smooth, and he pulled it out. He could hardly believe his luck. It was a whiskey bottle with about a quarter of the liquid still inside. He slammed the base of the bottle down on his mother's hand and felt something crack. She shrieked and yanked her hand away, ripping a wider hole in his ankle. 
Despite his bleeding foot, Sam tried to stand and was horrified to see his mother was trying to do the same. Her head lulled around like a balloon on a stick, too heavy for her skinny neck to support. She had to use her good hand to hold it up high enough to see him. She came at him, the growths on her legs jangling like baubles on a morbid Christmas tree. Her thighs and lower legs were emaciated beyond reason, no more than a skin-colored coat of paint directly over her bones. Her bulging lips parted in a rictus grin, revealing stubs of wonky teeth poking from pustulant gums. Sam swiped at her with the heavy bottle, but she snatched it from his hand with unearthly quickness and threw it. It hit the door behind him, smashing loudly, and the sour odor of strong whiskey filled the air. Blossom mumbled, her tongue flapping like a fat gray maggot trying to escape from her swollen mouth. The words were ineligible, yet Sam recognized the venom in them. You did this, you fucking little devil. I didn't, Sam protested, tears filling his eyes. But he had done this. He was sure of it. His mother reached for his throat, but to do so, she had to move her hand from her head. The fluid-filled sack that was once her forehead immediately sagged over her right eye, like leftover gravy sliding from a pan. A sudden loss of vision must have thrown her off her perception and her thorned hand whipped past the soft skin of his neck and slid across his shoulder, tearing as it went. Sam shouted in pain and tried to shove her away, but she was too strong. She brought her head up to look at him, swiped at him again, and this time she caught him on the side of the head. He felt a stretching sensation across his forehead and his vision went red as blood cascaded down his face. He reached up and felt something soft and wet, a flap of skin coming away from his brow. His foot skidded on the whiskey-covered floor and he lost his footing, falling hard onto broken glass. His shoulder blade lit up with red-hot pain as a piece of the broken bottle pierced his flesh near his shoulder blade. He didn't know how big the shard was or how deep it reached into his back, but he had to fight off the sudden urge to faint. He had never been stabbed before, as is the case with many 12-year-olds, and it was stranger than he could have ever imagined. It felt as if someone had taken their finger and poked it into his flesh so hard that it pushed the fabric of his shirt inside his body. The pressure and heat was immense, nauseating. Sam wiped his hand across his face, clearing some of the blood and he gasped when he spotted his mother bearing down on him. She was coming forward, the bony framework of her skeleton helplessly following her disproportionate head as it fell towards him. She was going to land on top of him. And then what? Sam didn't want to find out, so he grabbed the first thing within reach, put it between himself and her falling body, and closed his eyes. There was a wet, shucking noise Sam didn't recognize, followed by a cacophony of wheezing gurgles. And then it stopped. He opened his eyes to see his mother had landed on top of him. Her one visible eye was locked onto his. Though the fire in them was quickly fading, Sam felt something hot and wet on his chest, which turned out to be blood. His first thought was that she had eviscerated him, broken him open like a mince pie with her thorns, and he searched frantically with his eyes for his spilled organs, his filling. He didn't find anything and realized the blood wasn't his. When she had fallen towards him, he had instinctively snatched the broken whiskey bottle from the floor beside him and was now gripping the neck so tightly that his fingertips had turned white. On the opposite end, pointed upwards and away from him, was the base of the bottle. The glass was jagged along the lower half, and it was this end that was now embedded into the underside of his mother's chin, opening her throat like a slit in a waterbed. A crimson cascade escaped her body in great gouts of arterial spray. Some of it was pouring and funneling through the void of the bottle, coming out through the other end in staggered, chugging glugs. The penny-like smell of blood assaulted his nostrils, 
mingling with the sweet decay in his mother's last breath. Sam turned on his side and put the bottle against the floor before sliding out from beneath her. The lip and collar of the bottle wedged along a groove between two floorboards and remained upright, balanced precariously. It propped up Blossom's impaled chin as the rest of her body sagged lifelessly against the floor. It looked almost as though she were performing some kind of hideous yoga technique. Sam stood, his knees shaking, and drew in several long, heaving breaths. He felt as though his lungs were full of fiberglass threads, each gasp forcing his body to shudder like a struck tuning fork. He took a step towards the door and heard a loud hiss that halted him. At first, he didn't know what it was, but when the hiss came again, louder this time, he found its source. His mother's head was moving, or to be more precise, the skin of her head was. Waves pulsated beneath the inflated flesh, rippling down from her crown to her chin. Sam thought of a way a bowl of water sent out ripples when a droplet landed in it. There were angry red splits appearing from an opening at the very top of her head, running vertically downwards like the segments of an orange. One line ran perfectly along the center of her nose and mouth, having her bulbous face into two equally horrible parts. Another hiss came as a hole at the tip peeled open further along the red splits, letting out a puff of particles into the air. The splitting skin curled, opening the top of her head like the petals of a lily, Sam's favorite flower. He watched as it hissed again, revealing the magnolia gleam of bone beneath. Her head was peeling open. Thick strands of sticky red mucus stretched between the flaps as they pulled away from her skull. As Sam watched, helpless, her head folded open fully with an almighty rip. The thick petals of head flesh settled against her dead shoulders with a soft slap, glistening wetly in the sodium vapor of the street lamps. Sat in the center was her skull, perched on the ruined remnants of her head like a priceless treasure on a red velvet pillow. There was something beautiful about the final form her body took as it expired but all Sam wanted to do was run away. He felt something salty drip over his top lip, mingling with the coppery blood, and he realized he was crying. Not just crying, but bawling. His emotions exploded out of him like a burst dam, an overwhelming tide that poured out unbidden. He bolted for the door, needing to be out of this room, needing to be anywhere else other than here. As he pulled it open, he saw Blossom's skull tumble from its perch, clattering to the ground. It sounded like someone dropping a bundle of wet sticks. Her skull tumbled end over end before coming to a rest against his foot. I'm sorry, Sam blurted, running away from his mother's empty accusatory eye sockets. Sam stumbled out of the front door into the night air, it was dark, but he did not know the exact time. It felt like he had been inside that room for hours. Even though he was far from the bedroom where his mother's absurd corpse lay, he could still smell the sweet, musky aroma of her decay clinging to him. He tried to stop the bleeding from his various wounds, but there were too many to count, and his head was a churning vat of nausea. The gash on his brow had slowed, but the blood around his eyes had turned dark and sticky. Every blink became a concerted effort. There was a deep, haunting throb somewhere near his shoulder blade, and when he lifted his arm, he could feel the muscles in his back bunching up against some kind of barrier. He guessed it was the shard of broken glass he had fallen on. His ankle gave way each time he attempted to put weight on it, giving him a lurching limp when he opened the front door and plodded out into the garden path. 
Sam glanced at his mother's rosebush and saw that the flowers had bloomed, a crimson core burning within the black petals like a hot coal in a log burner. He staggered towards the bush and snapped off every single flower, dropping them onto the ground. He stepped on them, crushing the delicate petals under his heel. This isn't what I wanted, he said quietly, though he wasn't sure to whom. Another noise caught his attention, a thrumming hum from somewhere beyond the garden. He followed it and saw a parked car against the curb. Its engine idled gently, but the lights were off. Through the dim auburn light of the street lamp, he could see a figure in the driver's seat, the vague silhouette of a man with his head tilted back on the headrest as if he were taking a quick nap. Sam hobbled closer and tapped the glass. The man gave no response. Help, Sam whimpered. His voice was hoarse. Help me. Nothing. He tapped harder, begging. Please, help me. The man didn't flinch. Was he okay in there? Sam cupped his hands over the glass and leaned his face into them, hoping to see who was inside. He saw and he screamed. The figure flinched into life at the sound and Sam jerked away, falling to the ground. His backside thudded hard against the pavement. He wheezed frantically, his breath evading him. The door of the car swung open and Dr. Reese flopped out. His head was swollen and bleeding just like Sam's mother's had been. Hard black spikes and bulbs of flesh covered his face and hands. The thing that had been Dr. Reese mumbled incoherently, but the words clogged in his mouth, trapped behind the wads of bloody yellow mucus that oozed from his scabbed lips. He manacled his hand over Sam's leg, the thorns on his palms digging into his shin like the barbed teeth of a leech. Sam didn't scream. He had no breath left to do so. He had just enough time to wonder whether Dr. Reese had even left at all earlier that day. Sam supposed it didn't matter. Either way, the doctor had kept his promise. He had come back. And now he was climbing on top Sam with madness and desperation in his eyes, his body ripping and bursting and blooming like a flower of flesh and blood.